answers. And so what does Jonah do? Jonah says, absolutely, God. Yes, 100% as a prophet of the Lord Almighty, I will walk with you. Nope, Jonah does what every one of us would do, to be honest. And Jonah goes literally in the opposite direction. Tarshish is the exact opposite direction of Assyria from where Jonah was at. He literally said, Syria is that way, Nineveh is that way, awesome. I'm gonna walk this way. And you know the crazy part about the story is, is that when Jonah was fleeing from God, he wasn't, he wasn't fleeing because he was scared to walk into the city. He wasn't fleeing because he knew that they were a brutal enemy of the Israelites. He was actually fearful that God would redeem them. He was fearful that he would go out and cry against them as a prophet of the Lord, and then God would have mercy in God's own kingdom. See, I want to tell you something. Jonah was in the bottom of that boat because he was hiding something. He was hiding that he was fleeing from God. He was holding a secret. See, we think we keep secrets from people. I want you to hear that again. We think we keep secrets from people, but a secret is just really of an evidence of really not being connected with God and being separated from God. What are you willing to sacrifice in your relationships for the sake of love. Because what we're willing to stand on is our pride. What we're willing to stand on is who we are and what we define and what we said was gonna be the reality. And the moment it steps out of the reality, we're either gonna stand up and say, nope, this is how it is, or we're gonna be willing to sacrifice and humble ourselves for the sake of the ones that we love. And if we're talking that loving is easy, it truly is. But loving your enemy, as Jonah has asked to do, that's godly. And last week, as you heard, we talked about Jonah. And we talked about Jonah running away from God. And he was really running away from the people that God told him to go to, which were the Assyrians. And so you have the Israelites, and Jonah's a Hebrew, right, which are God's chosen people. And then you had the Assyrians, which were God's enemies. And so God said, go to the enemy of Israel, and I want you to tell them that there's judgment coming upon them. Which Jonah heard as, go tell them there's judgment, so they might have the opportunity to repent and redeem themselves. And Jonah was like, I don't want to do that. There are enemies, let alone they were brutal enemies. They were not nice to the Hebrew people. It was not pretty. And so he's like, not only it's not safe, you know, like there's a whole bunch of things. And if I go over there and I'm a prophet and I tell them that they're going to be judged and then you don't judge them, what do I look like as a prophet? You know, like it's so Jonah was going through this conflicted moment where he left and it was all about enemies. It was all about the people in his life that he didn't want to go and have relationship with. How many of you love to have a relationship with enemies? Is there anyone out there? Okay, let's just, let me start with a different question. How many of you have enemies? Can you raise your hand if you have enemies? Oh, you better be honest before God. I am telling you right now, this message is pinning on the fact that you have enemies, right? Does, so one more time, how many of you, okay, let me make it easier because I know this is uncomfortable. How many of you have ever had an enemy at one time in your life before? Maybe not now. Maybe it's not someone in your family, right? but you've had an enemy before. Okay. Are we good there now? Okay. Does everyone feel more comfortable? You qualify for that one. Okay. That's great. Thank you for that. Let's talk about enemies for a second. Um, enemies come in many different forms, many different forms. Uh, my family and I had a first yesterday. Uh, my daughter is on a traveling sports team now. Whoa. So how many parents have done traveling sports before? Yes. Okay. My daughter's on a traveling volleyball team now. Um, we, she tried out and she hadn't played volleyball before. She has some athletic ability. Uh, she had played six weeks of volleyball and we put her in her tryouts to see, you know, what would happen. And they had a local team when we we're like, well, of course she's only played six weeks of volleyball. Like she's played six total matches, not sets, matches. See, I'm getting the lingo down already. <laughs> I'm a volleyball dad. <laughs> so good. All right, here we go. So she's played six total matches and uh, she tried out and they're like, boom, she made regional. I'm like, no, how far is regional? You know, like the moment you're probably like, yeah, how much is it going to cost? So like, I mean, I love you, but I don't want you to start off as my enemy. Like I know we got into the tryouts, but really, ha- oh my gosh, is that how much it is? You know, and then you get in, they're like, don't worry. It's much more every weekend when you go, you just don't realize it yet. There should be an awareness for parents who are new into traveling teams that the initial cost pales in comparison to the monthly cost of traveling to these events. Does everyone know that? If you don't come talk to me, I will give you a revelation that you will understand and appreciate and budget for. 
forever and now. In fact, start saving like it's a college fund because that's what it is. Okay, here we go. So we get out there. It's Kaylee's first tournament and she is stoked. She wants extra sleep the night before. We have to go to Tulsa the night before so she can have a good night's of sleep. She wants to wake up early. She wants to be at the thing early. We show up at the Titan Sports Fitness Center, right? In Tulsa, if you've ever been there, massive facility. 2,500 people are in this facility. They have minimum, minimum 24 matches going on at the same time. That's 48 teams going with teams in the wings waiting to go. This is what happened yesterday. <laughs> so we get there and there's just energy. There's this like palpable, like, wow, what's happening? We're all excited and everything else. And then you show up to the court and it's like, you're my enemy. Like everything changed all of a sudden. Like we walked in and this first set of girls, we walked by like the 16 year olds and they were just mean. They were so angry, right? And then they get all, I don't know if you watched volleyball, they get really happy with everything that happens. And then it's immediate, and then super happy at the court. Like, and I'm like, it's so much emotion at the same time, right? So I was like, Kaylee, no matter what happens today, like, it's all about you learning. It's the first time. And I tell my family, we always learn the first time. We have no expectations the first time out. You are learning, you're exploring, you're growing, right? Once you know what can happen, then you can train different. You can expect different things. You can have different emotions. But the first time out, it's just a learning experience. She's like, yeah, dad, it's going to go great, dad. I said, great. She lost every single match and every single set of everything that they did. Every enemy won. Every enemy won. So here's what happened. You know all those moments in your life when you have another enemy and then you come back into your loved ones and because something happened with that enemy, it affects your loved one's relationships? Do you guys know that? Like you bring that feeling and emotion into that relationship. So we brought our son with us, Landon, and he was sitting there the whole day and he, he needs food. He's like an engine. And if you don't feed it, it dies at some point, but it dies in the most like, wrong spot, like on the side of a road in the dark, like and you have no place, no cell signal, like, and, and then it starts to smoke, right? And then, it, and then you have to get out and it's cold outside. Like that's how he dies, right? Like, so he was slowly dying. Um, as this was happening, we're like, dude, just support Kaylee. Like you're here to support Kaylee. Get off your phone. That's another trigger. Like, like, just like be here to support Kaylee. So she gets done and we were there from 7.30 to 1.15, right? Just sitting there watching right on bleachers, just going, right? So he gets done and he's excited. He like, there's food on the horizon. Like we're done. He doesn't realize that she has to now ref the next match and he doesn't know that and we can't tell him because we're good parents. So we hide things from our children. And so we're sitting there and he's getting ready and unprompted from us, unprompted. Kaylee walks over and I can see her look. Her look is, I had a great day, this bites. You know, like that, I was going to say the word, but in church, it's bites, okay? This bites, right? Like, I could see that. Like, she's a competitive person in her soul. She has that in her, right? She's, she's my child, right? She's just competitive to the core. And I could see that. And I was like, hey, first time out, it's okay. Doesn't matter. Plus, your tournament's today. That's just pool play. You learn that too. Like, and they don't tell you schedules. Super cool. So I'm like, great. So pool plays tomorrow. Like, pool plays today. You got a tournament tomorrow. You guys can rebound. It's going to be great. All right? You'll be like the Green Bay Packers. <laughs> just kidding. All right? So, okay, here we go. And so, <laughs> nugget. All right, here we go. <laughs> uh, for all my, like, Lutheran North Dakota people, like, in like, everyone up there in the North, my bad, but not really. Okay, here we go. So... Landon walks over, Kaylee walks up the field, she gives me a hug, she goes, Dad, I had a great day, awesome, and I can see that she's struggling. Landon walks up to her, unprompted from us, and he goes, Kaylee, you did great today, and I'm really proud of you. And Jess and I looked at each other, we're like, and my, you could see like the tears starting to well up, I'm like, we've done so good as parents, <laughs> but oh my God, like, don't cry on the volleyball court, it's so good. And Kaylee goes, whatever, I lost everything. And she walked away. <laughs> We've done horrible as parents. Horrible, right? Her enemies affected her and then affected her loved ones. They affected the people around her and she didn't realize it because who was she thinking about? She was thinking about who? Her enemies. She wasn't thinking about the people in her life that are supporting her. She couldn't separate herself from the enemy to be with the people that loved her. Sometimes you can't separate ourselves from our enemies to be with God who loves us. Do you see what I'm saying? 
And what ended up happening is Landon was crushed. So then what we have to do as parents, now we have to go in and support Landon and we have to pull him out. And then we have to go back to camp. Do you see what happens with this? Like all of a sudden now you've got other people in the support that have to take away from their lives so that you can go back to this person, get, pull them back into the relationship, build this person up, pull them back into the relationship, bring them together so that we can see what's going on. And it, has, it can't be forced either. You can't say, go apologize to your brother, right? That's just a forced relationship. They have to understand the relationship. And when you understand the relationship, you can then get to a place where you're like, wow, I'm understanding a little bit of love and enemies don't affect me in that way anymore. The difference with Jonah is Jonah said, I don't want to go to my enemies. I understand the love of God, but it's not enough to overcome how I feel about my enemies. Ah. So today's going to be about what happens with Jonah going forward because God's still about redeeming even your enemies. Just because you don't want to doesn't mean that God's not going to use you to do it. Can I say that one more time? Just because you don't want to redeem your enemies and have grace for them doesn't mean that God's not going to use you to do it anyways. And that's what we see in Jonah. So let's dig back into scripture today and talk through that a little bit. So we're going to be in Jonah. So um, Jonah's awesome, right? As you get in the Old Testament, right, you're getting through some wonderful scripture. You got Amos, um, Joel, Amos, right? You kind of see in that area, you're going to get to Jonah. Uh, Micah's after that. So if you're, you're seeing any of those in the Old Testament, you're kind of getting where in your Jonah. It's about halfway through the Bible if you're opening the good book. And in fact, we love this in the church. We're a Bible-based church. Every church should be a Bible-based church. Um, people come to me and ask me as a pastor, very interestingly, they say, hey, do you read from the Bible in your church? And I'm like, I didn't know that was a question in a church. But I'm going to answer a big yes that we read from Scripture in the church. Um, but we love Bibles in the church. We love you to have this with you. It is an informing word. It guides your life. So if you got your Bible in your hand, raise it up. If you got your Bible in your hand. We love to raise Bibles up in the church. That's great. If you got a smartphone with you, raise that up. Guess what? We're going to put Scripture in your hands today through your smartphone. We are on the Bible app. You'll see a QR code up on the screen. If you're online, you can download that also. There's a QR code that'll pop up there on the chair backs in front of you here. It'll say Bible app. You can scan that and it'll open the Bible app for you. And we have scripture notes on there. We have devotions on there with Jonah. You can follow your own devotion so you can have daily reflection with God. And so um, love Bibles, love Bibles. In fact, you know what we used to say in this church? We used to say, everyone bring a Bible. You guys remember that? We're going to shout that today. So on the count of three, shout, everyone bring a Bible. One, two, three. That's what it should be every single day. All right, here we go. We're going to be in Jonah and we're going to be reading back in chapter one again. And we're going to be reading verses 11 through 17, 11 through 17. And uh, here's what's happened so far is Jonah said, I I'm not going to Assyria, right? I'm not going to go to Nineveh where the Assyrians are at. Uh, I'm going to go to Tarshish, which is the exact opposite direction. So he got with some mariners, some boat people and said, um, can you take me over to Tarshish? And so he got in a boat to go to Tarshish fleeing from God, but didn't tell anyone he was fleeing from God. And at this point, um, they're on the boat and they start to realize that someone is doing something wrong because there's a big storm and they're all about to die. And um, when they're about to die, they said, we're going to toss everything over the boat to see if we can right the boat. They toss everything over the boat, sacrifice all their goods, no matter what's on the ship. And it still doesn't happen. So they run down to Jonah and say, who are you? Who is your God? And who is your people? What was he supposed to go to Nineveh to do? <laughs> who are you? I'm Jonah. I'm a prophet of the Lord Almighty. Who is your God? God Almighty, right? Jehovah's our God, right? Yahweh is our God, right? What are you here to do? Well, I'm here to tell you that <laughs> you're about to be judged and that you should repent and turn to God. What did the boat people ask him who were also pagans and Assyrians? <laughs> the same people that he said he wouldn't go to. He found himself with. Do you see what God does? Even though you don't want to do it, God's still going to use you to do it for the people that you might call your enemies. So he says, yes, I'm Jonah. I'm a Hebrew. I believe in the Lord God Almighty, the God of heaven and earth, the God of sea and storm. Yes, the God of this sea that's raging. My God can stop that. <laughs> that's, that's who I am. And they said, what are you doing then? Like, pray to your God. They're, they're telling Jonah how to have a relationship with God. And that's where we find ourselves in this scripture right now. We find ourselves with Jonah. So here's what happens. Verse 11. Then they said to him, what shall we do to you that the sea may quiet down for us? For the sea was growing more and more, and in a beautiful word that I think is only once in Scripture, tempestuous. That's a beautiful word in Scripture. Have you ever seen that word in Scripture before? Well, the neighborhood churches gave it to you. Okay. For the sea was growing more and more tempestuous. He said to them, pick me up 
and throw me into the sea. Then the sea will quiet down for you. For I know it is because of me that this great storm has come upon you. It is me, your enemy, that has caused a great storm for you. Nevertheless, the men rowed hard to bring the ship back to land, but they could not. For the sea grew more and more stormy against them. Then they cried out to the Lord, Please, O Lord, we pray, do not let us perish on account of this man's life. Do not make us guilty of an innocent life. Do not make us guilty of innocent blood. For you, O Lord, have done as it has pleased you. So they picked Jonah up and threw him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord even more, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. But the Lord provided a large fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights. Jonah and the whale, right? Nope, great fish, great fish. Everyone says whale, it's great fish. All right, here we go. Here's what we're seeing from the story of Jonah today. And it's really a story that begins with our plan and how our plan work, or what I call people's plans. And it's, it's what happens when we run from God and what happens when we either get involved with enemies or we don't understand the plan and the process. We tend to have our own idea of what we're supposed to do. And it's usually not first we go to God and we give it to God and say, God, you have this. I know you have this. So I'm going to step back and I'm going to have faith in you and your plan. Guide me. That's usually not our first result. Our first result is exactly what happened here. They threw everything over the ship. Right? When you're trying to gain control of your life, what do you do? Do you remove everything that's a distraction? Think about that right now. How many of you do that when you're trying to gain control of your life? You're like, I'm not going to worry about that. Not going to worry about that. I have control over this one thing. That's it. Everything else is off the boat. That's what they did. They threw everything off the boat. They got rid of everything. See, people's plans begin with getting rid of everything. That's what happens. See, we get rid of everything, and then we say, okay, now, now that I've gotten rid of everything, uh, we get to the next part, and it's, it's this part right here in verse 13. It says this. In verse 13, it says, nevertheless, the men rode hard to bring the ship back to land. So they got rid of everything. Jonah said, hey, my God's the only person who can do this. And they said, don't worry, we're going to try and row one more time now to get us back to land. How many of you, in times that things are out of control, and you've released everything around you to try to do it yourself, then you say, okay, now that I've shed everything and I have control, Lord, I'm going to try this one more time on my own because I think I have control of my situation again. How many of you are guilty of trying to re-control your situations after you've released everything? Saying, I'm still the one that can do this. That's a people's plan. People's plan is get rid of everything, try it again ourselves. Think about that. And the next thing we do is what? Then we truly get rid of everything. And lastly, we give it to God. See, that's how a people's plan works. And they do it here. They get rid of everything, right? And they say, hold on a second, enemy or not, we've gotten rid of everything. We're going to try and roll back. Okay, we've done it ourselves. No, we've got to get rid of everything. And the next person is Jonah. That's the everything. And he says, look, if you throw me into the sea, like that's how this works. I'll be released and you'll be safe. And we do that. And then we give it to God. See, God's plan is different though. See, God's plan begins in a beautiful way. God's plan begins like this. God's plan begins with create relationship. That's how it begins. See, what they didn't do first is they threw everything over the boat. And then they came to Jonah and said, who are you? Who is your God? And what do you have to say? See, they threw everything over the boat and then tried to create relationship. What God does with us and what we need to do with our people around us with our enemies is we need to create relationship first. We need to say, who are you? Where do you come from? Who are your people? And in fact, when Jess and I were talking about these volley teams, we had no idea where they were from. Like we got the end like, like, you remember the orange team? Like orange team, I'm like, where were they from? We're like, we have no idea. We have no idea who the enemies were. And I'm like, I, I didn't meet a single soul. We called the one coach of the other girls team. Like, if you ever seen like a basketball coach in like a college women's basketball, and they're like, come on, let's go. Like that, that was like, their 10-year-old coach on their side. And I'm like, dang. So we called her the women's basketball coach. Like that's all we could come up with. We never went over and said, hey, who are you? We'd just love to meet you. All right, we're an opposing team. We're your enemy today. And my name's Joe Lyles. I'm a pastor. So I love you, but I hate you. No, I didn't. Just kidding. That's not true. Hate's a strong word. Don't use hate. Don't ever use hate. So here we go. So 
what they do in God's plan is to create relationship first. And here's what comes next in God's plan. It's to serve and sacrifice, isn't it? Jesus came to what? To serve and not be served. So the second part of the plan is to serve and then sacrifice. It's about our own sacrifice. And Jonah starts to learn that, right? It's, it's, a, it's a little late in the game, but there's no reason we can't come back to God in that way and come back to these relationships. Jonah says, look, I'm the sacrifice. I, I, okay, if I'm going to serve you, I need to be sacrificed. This is what's going to help. And he takes upon now what? God's plan. When we realize that we can sacrifice who we are for the sake of others, and that relationship and that love of God is more important, it begins to align to God's plan. And then God's plan leads to repentance and redemption. That's what happens. Repentance is the changing of ways. It's the turning around. What is God doing to Jonah? God's saying, turn around, Jonah. I'm going to take you back. You got to turn around. And that repentance leads to redemption. A redemption that is holy, not based on this earth. And so you have this going on in this relationship. And, and I wonder if we do that with our enemies. Do you have that, I want to create relationship. I need to know what's going on in your life. Because usually when there's something going on and people are doing this with each other, there's a lot more underneath. And if you took a second to pause and stop and have a conversation about the relationship, you can understand a lot more about what's going on. And then if you're willing to serve that person undeservedly with grace and sacrifice your pride for the sake of the love of God in that relationship, it can lead to repentance. It can lead to change and redemption. But how often do we do that when we're walking back to God? If you want to walk back to God or begin that relationship, it needs to begin to align to God's plan. It has to. Now listen what happens next. This part is great. Verse 16. Jump to the end of this. Then the men, the mariners, the pagans, the Assyrians, the ones who believed in other gods, heard all this was happening. They've now seen that the storm has stopped. Jonah's over the boat. And it says this, then the men feared the Lord even more and they offered a sacrifice. What's the part of God's plan? Sacrifice and service. They offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made what? Vows. They made a commitment. And here is where I think we struggle. See, a vow is a promise to do things differently going forward, not based on right now. A vow is a promise to do things different moving forward, not based on now. And they made a vow before God to have a relationship with God that looked different than before. Which leads me to a question for you. We know a vow is really in one way in life, if I really think through a vow, right, we know of marriage vows. Is that true for everyone, right? Like that's kind of when we think of vow, do you think of anything else, anyone out there? It's, it really comes across in marriage vows. And it's that commitment for what? Commitment saying, hey, we're going to stand before, um, many people hate writing their own vows. So that's like, hey, whatever language you can give me is really good. You know, like that forever and ever till death do us part, sickness and health, love that. Can you use that in our marriage? Absolutely. That's wonderful. And we make this vow, but you know what happens in our relationship with God is, and where our relationship in marriage is, is how often do we go back and say, hey, I'm recommitting to this relationship. I'm making a new vow in our relationship. Think about that in your own life right now. How many of you have done that in your own personal relationships or your relationship with God? It's so big in our life that we call it a renewal of vows. Like it's its own service. Like, that's how big it is. What if it wasn't that big? What if it was something that we could do on a daily basis or a weekly basis? Or if we went through a season in our lives and in our relationships, we'd be like, hey, hold on. We need to recommit to each other right now. We need to stand before and say, hey, going forward, things are going to look different. We need to have a renewal of our vows. And I'm going to tell you what these new vows are. That's what the people are doing here. And I think in our relationship with God, it's something that we have to do also. We have to renew our commitment to God. Ask yourself, when was the last time you renewed your commitment to God? When was the last time that you had a season in your life that said, hey, this season was so big in my life and I saw what you did in it that I'm gonna pause right now and I'm gonna make vows to you, Lord. 
I'm going to make vows and say, this is who I am in relationship with you because I see what you're doing in my life. I see it. That's where I think we need to be. If we want to overcome that relationship to our enemies, we have to make that commitment to God. And we have to start there. And we're seeing it from enemies of God committing to God. And yet we don't do it as Christians. What? That's the crazy part of this. We need to lead that relationship in an amazing way. And then watch what happens next. Verse 17. But the Lord provided a large fish to swallow up Jonah. But the Lord provided a large fish to swallow up Jonah. How many of you have asked the Lord to give you a sign? Like tell you the path that's coming? How many of you have asked the Lord to like, to give you things, really? Like, I'm looking for this in my life, Lord. Can you provide this for me, Lord? I mean, think of those prayers that you've asked the Lord to give you. Did it ever include a great fish? Like, ever? Let's be honest, right? Did it ever include a great fish? Anyone? Anyone? I mean, besides the fisher people out there, like people who are fishermen, like, Lord, I'm just praying for a great fish right now. Like, that doesn't count. Don't pray for a great fish. <laughs> think about that for a second. But why I stopped on this is it said the Lord provided. Hold on a second. I didn't pray for that provision. I've never prayed for that provision. I've never been prayed to swallow up for three days, right? In a place where I don't have any control of the surroundings around me, in a place that's probably dark, in a place that's only me and my thoughts that I can't talk to anyone. Yep, not on my prayer list. Still not on my prayer list. And yet it said the Lord provided. So it made me stop. And it made me think. I want you to think about your enemies for a second. And I know this is hard, so I want you to really think about it. And I want you to think about that big fight that you had with your enemies. And any enemy in life, not the current ones, it can be the current ones, but just to make you comfortable. Think about that big fight that you had, or the fights that you had over your life, the seasons that you've had. And I want you to think about the storm that was tempestuous, the storm that was raging and sloshing across the boats and the lightning and the thunder and the loud I want you to think about all these things that are happening in this fight that you had, this big fight in the season. And I want you to imagine the calm of a room being provided for you just to be with God. And I want you to ask yourself, when you were in those fights and those storms, did you pray for a quiet place and peace? See, what I think what happens is we pray for certain things that we only think about and can conjecture, but God's still providing those but it's uncomfortable, isn't it? It's uncomfortable to think that the storm that's raging, that sometimes that quiet is as deafening in our life. That the storm can be so loud. It can be so, uh, just an uproar of things that are just taking apart everything in our life. And yet when we move away from that storm, finally we get into this quiet and peace that is also just as deafening because we haven't spent that time to understand what it means to be in that relationship with God but more so it's something more important. It's because we're not seeking the right peace. To be honest, we're seeking a peace that we're trying to control. We're seeking a peace that only exists in the way that we understand it. We're seeking a peace where it's comfortable and we're surrounded and we're warm and and really people care for us and they say it's going to be all right and everything's going to be okay. And it's the exact peace that we think we need to hear. And I can tell you right now, you will search for that peace for the rest of your life. Because the peace you're trying to find only comes from God. It truly does. It only comes from God. And when you figure out that God's plan is to give it back to God in your life, you will find that peace and it's called salvation. Truly. It's the room being prepared for you in the kingdom of heaven. Do you know why this language was so important to me? Prepared a large fish, great fish. Because Jesus says the same thing when he says, I go ahead of you to prepare a room for you. Same word. We just think about those two scenarios a lot different, don't we? The peace that you're looking for walking back in your relationship with God is a peace that truly only comes from God. 
And my hope is that we find that together. And if you truly live into this text, my hope is that you give that peace to others. And all God's people said, amen.